I'm off and running. I'm not turning back. I like that. I'm off and running, and I'm not turning back. So the, I want to use this verse as a framework for understanding what it is to press towards the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. The first thing we have to do is not look back. And I think that simply means, the question the Lord asked me about this particular part of the scripture was, have I allowed the gospel, the reality of the gospel, to affect every situation and circumstance of my past? Have I allowed what Jesus did on the cross to affect everything back there is something from back there gnawing at me where i can't really move on the bible talks about the weights the things that so easily beset us things that hold us back and the question the lord has been asking me is is there anything back there that's holding me back our victories you know sometimes it's not just failures that hold us back. Do you realize that sometimes our victories hold us back? Sometimes we're so caught up in what the Lord did yesterday in us that we can't allow him to work in us today. We're, talk, we're so excited about what happened yesterday, the good things, that we just, we kind of feel like we can go on, we can keep coasting today. We don't have to worry about we don't have to worry about some, doing something exciting, experiencing something new in him today because of what happened yesterday. But for most of us, it's not our victories that cause us problems. It's our failures. How many of you right now, when I mention failure, right away something that you did in the past came to mind? I know it does for me. But if we allow the gospel to affect our past, we should be able to do what Paul said to the Philippians. We should be able to forget those things that are behind because they're covered in the blood. It doesn't matter what that failure that came to your mind was. If it, the Bible teaches us that if we confess our sins, he is able to, and just or faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Therefore, if we if that came back to you like it does for me sometimes, we need to remind ourselves, like uh, like Reese preached weeks ago, months ago now, remind ourselves of the gospel. We need to remind ourselves that if we're drudging up failures from our past. It's because we don't completely appreciate the work that the cross did for us. Also, hurts, forget, unforgiveness, relationships, there's all kinds of things that can hold us back. Paul instructs us to forget those things. Now, that doesn't mean that if you're like me and you're one of those people that read these things exactly, that doesn't mean that if you happen to remember something, all of a sudden you're not obeying this verse, but it's an active thing. Are we, instead of facing forward, facing backwards? We're remembering and drudging up and thinking about all those things back there and allowing them to become a weight to us rather than pressing forward in him. So we don't want to look back. The next thing that, the Bible tell, that Paul tells us here is that we press to lay hold for that which, which Christ Jesus has laid hold of me, I do not count myself to have apprehended. I think that goes to what Phil shared with us this morning. He realized that, I think Paul, if, if Phil had, had said, raise your hand if you're naive, I think Phil, Paul would have been one that raised his hand, realizing that he had a long way still yet to go. But it says in verse 14 that I press toward the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. What is that high calling? We're pressing towards something. 
When we're running a race, those of you that have run a race, I've never run a race, but we'll just speak metaphorically of those who run races. Phil has probably run races before. You get to the end and you know what the end looks like. A lot of times there's a ribbon, there's big flags. I've, I've, I have sat there watching people race and been there not exerting anything myself, but watching people run through. We know what that looks like. We know what the finish line looks like. But I think in Christianity, sometimes we, we mistake what the finish line looks like. The finish line isn't the finish line isn't about getting somewhere or being where it's not getting to a plateau where you don't have to worry about stuff anymore. It's not oh man I'm better than everybody else or I'm like everybody else. That's not what the finish line looks like and yet sometimes when we imagine what it looks like to arrive I think it's different than we imagine it. And so I want to read a few verses that talk about our calling. Ephesians 4, verse number 1, says, I therefore, the prisoner of the Lord, beseech you, walk worthy of the calling wherewith you were called, with all pride and amazingness that you got there. No, that's not what it says with all lowliness and gentleness and with long suffering, bearing with one another in love, endeavoring to keep the unity of the spirit in the bond of peace. There is one body, one spirit, just as you were called in one hope of your calling, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and father of all who is above all and through all and in you all. I want you to notice that the arriving doesn't bring condem the, the, the journey, the calling that God has given us doesn't bring condemnation. It doesn't say in condemnation of your calling. If your understanding of what God has called us to as Christians makes you down and makes you feel condemned, then we don't truly understand what it is we're being called to. It says the hope of your calling. My children hope for that it's close to their birthday. They hope that, you know, they hope that they get to eat ice cream when they get home. They're, they're not going to get to eat ice cream when they get home, but, but they hope so. We all hoped today that Josh was going to bring his chicken, but he didn't. He's not here. But hope is a good thing. Hope is something we look forward to. And I think sometimes in this Christian life, it's easy for us to put ourselves under a load of guilt, a burden that God never meant for us to be put under. This calling is something He's calling us to. It's something, it's a work that He is doing in us. It's not something that we're trying really, really, really hard to do better and better and better every day. That's when we begin to feel condemned. 1 Corinthians 1.27 says, Foresee your calling, brethren, that not many wise according to the flesh, not many mighty, not many noble are called, but God has chosen the foolish things of the world to put to shame the wise, and God has chosen the weak things of the world to put to shame the the things which are mighty and the base things of the world and the things which are despised, God has chosen. And the things which are not to bring to nothing the things that are. Why? That no flesh should glory in his presence. But of him you are in Christ Jesus who became for us wisdom from God and righteousness and sanctification and redemption that it as it is written he who glories let him glory in the lord one person paraphrased what paul said this way god often uses the cheesy to confound the sophisticated he regularly honors those who are confused about his leading as if they had nailed it in other words 
we're not trying if in our running of this race, this is where the race analogy breaks down. Phil runs a lot. I run very little. If Phil ran a race, Phil could probably point back to all of those times that he got up when he didn't feel like it and ran 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 some more till when 13 miles is no big deal. 23 miles is no big deal. Or 26, or 26 for a marathon. It's no big deal because he's run so far before. Christian life isn't that way. I love that Paul talks about who God chooses not to be the athletic, the amazing, the wonderful, the strong, the smart, the those that have never messed up and those that have never sinned, those that have never had a problem. That is not who God chooses. And so if your conception of what it is to press towards the mark of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus makes you feel depressed and down, it's because you're looking at yourself and you're thinking that God chooses the ones who've never messed up. God chooses those who are smart and wise and understand everything. That isn't who God chooses. That's not who the cross was for. Our calling gives us hope because we fit right in here. I fit right in here. Not noble, foolish, unwise, not mighty. The things that are not to put to, de to, to, to confound the things that are. And I think we should all find comfort if we, fi if we can find ourselves within this, with this scripture. We can say, you know what? I have messed up. I, I do need help. I do lack wisdom. I do need more of God every day. I, di I didn't deal with my children right yesterday. I, I, I didn't. I, was, I got a little angry when that happened. This is what we're being, they, these are the people, we are the people that he calls. We are the people that he chooses. And so, if you miss everything else about what I say today, I hope that you understand that if pressing towards the mark of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus, which should be the individual goal of every single believer in this room. That should be our individual goal. When we get up in the morning, I want to be more like Jesus. Every day, if somehow that depresses you, if somehow that makes you feel down, I hope that you will read 1 Corinthians 1 over and over and over and over again until you realize that we're just the kind of people that he called. And that if anything good comes from us, it comes from him. Another verse I love in Romans 11 says, the gifts and callings of God are irrevocable. And how I read that is, you're not just going to slip and mess up and all of a sudden you're not one of God's people anymore. I want you to understand that God sees us as redeemed community church. He sees our families. He sees each one of us in our families. And he says, you are just the kind of people I want. You're just the kind of people that I want to use. You're just the kind of people that I want to call and I am calling. So what does that calling look like? Like I said, it's not about people. It's not about power. It's not about position. It's not about arriving. That's not what his calling is about. First John, or John 17, 3 says, and this is eternal life that they may know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom you have sent. This is the calling, that we 
would know Jesus. And let me, one of the things the Lord has been speaking so strongly to my heart lately is that knowing Jesus isn't a church thing. It isn't a family thing. It's a me and Jesus thing. I think sometimes we get in this attitude, we get in this mindset of we're going somewhere. Yes, the Bible tells us that a city set on a hill will not be hidden. And so I do believe that God works marvelously through us as a church. But God will not work marvelously through us as a church where the gates of hell will not prevail against us unless the Joshes and the Bettys and the Cliffs and the Rubens and the Mikes and the, all of us, the individual ones of us are seeking to know Him. The, the Bible says this is eternal life. What that tells me is eternal life is not something we die to experience. Eternal life begins right now. Getting to know Jesus better every single day. Me, my relationship with Jesus. Not my relationship talking to Phil and his relationship being all connected and oh I got to do. No, my relationship with Jesus. We'll read in a little bit about, in Ephesians, about how God describes the church. And it's way different than some, some that we've been heard or how we've been led to believe. We need to understand that this high calling of God in Christ Jesus, this race that we're running, is between me and Jesus. And I have to be captivated by a desire to want to know him more. It doesn't matter how godly the people I hang around are. It doesn't matter the doctrinal statement or the mission statement of our church or the corporate vision or whatever that we have. It matters that I am being challenged by your walks and by my relationship with Lord the Lord, to want more of Him every single day. And again, that's not, that's not a, a burden. That's not, oh my, do I need to examine myself. Do I want Him more than I did yesterday? Do I? No, 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 no. It's really easy for me. I love the picture of how God tells us, Jesus tells us that through Paul, that our relationship with Him is like my relationship with Betty. I don't wake up every morning thinking, oh man, I really got to try to know Betty better today. It's a joy to get to know my wife better every single day. And I'll give you a clue. She's more amazing every single day. And all of us husbands would have a similar story that we feel more and more lucky every single day that we're married to our wife. And that's just a small picture of what it's like for us to love Jesus more and want to know him. I love that it says, this is eternal life. I believe that after I die, I'm going to continue to get to know him better. Even though those 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 curtains are going to come away and I'm not going to see through a glass darkly anymore. It is my eternal destiny to get to know Jesus more and more and more and more every day till the end of eternity, I get to have that relationship with him. I love what it says of Enoch in Hebrews 11:5. By faith, Enoch was taken away so that he did not see death and was not found because God had taken him. For before he was taken, he had this testimony that he pleased God. But without, God, and without faith, it is impossible to please him for he who comes to God must believe that he is and he is the rewarder of those that diligently seek him. 
They diligently seek him. That's the way I want my life to be. Every day, this high calling, this pressing towards the mark of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus, I want it to be like this. Every day, Josh Scott walking with Jesus. Just as I work, as I play with my kids, as I read my Bible, as I pray, as I hang out with you all, every day just walking with Jesus. Do you guys understand the power of what it looks like if all that's the testimony of every single one of our of, of every single one of our lives of every single one of our families that all what we want to do is walk with Jesus every single day that's joy there is no burden in that there is no heaviness in that there's just joy of getting to walk with Jesus every day. And what was Enoch's testimony? That he pleased God. Do you wonder sometimes if you're pleasing God? Does the devil get in there and try to mess with your conscience or mess with you? Oh, are you pleasing God today? Are you, are you doing enough today? Get rid of that trash. Just walk with Jesus. Every single day. And your testimony will be the same as Enoch's. That you please God. That's what it means to please God. Just get up. Good morning, Jesus. Have some good pillow worship. And just keep walking with Jesus every day. And I think what we're going to find, as we walk every day like that with him, as we partake of that eternal life that says that eternal life is to know him, it's going to change the way we think of everything. Because I don't know if this is the way it's been in your marriages, but when I got married, I wanted to be gone all the time. I'm an extrovert. That may surprise some of you. Um, but... I wanted to go to be doing parties, having people over, going and uh, going out to dinner, going and doing this, going and doing that, going and doing this other thing. And I don't know if you've noticed, my wife isn't that way. She doesn't, she'd be really happy. She teases that she'd be really happy if we had a little house on top of a mountain with a white picket fence, that we would just live up there and love Jesus and love each other and be together, homeschool our kids and It'd just be wonderful. I like staying home a lot more now than I used to. And she did, there was, a, I didn't go through some class, the Betty Scott School of Life, to understand how to be more like Betty. No. Just walking with her every day. It's contagious. That's the way it is with Jesus. Now, the, the truth of the matter is, she's way more extroverted than she used to be, too. But Jesus rubs off on us as we walk with him. We're not sitting there trying and working and, and, do, and, and being so worried that we're not doing it right. If we just walk with him, it'll amaze us how much we become like Jesus every single day. Lastly, the high calling that we are called to is described in Philippians 3, a little bit further down, or a little bit before what we read before, 3, verse 7. But th those things which were gained to me, those I counted lost for Christ. Yea, doubtless, and I count all things as lost for the excellency, excellency of the knowledge of Christ Jesus, my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things, and, and do count them as dung, that I may win Christ, and be found in him, having done it all right. That's not what it says. And being found in him, not having my own righteousness 
which is of the law, but that which is in faith of the faith of Christ, the righteousness which is of God by faith, that I may know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings being made conformable to his death. Again, it's his righteousness that rubs off on us as we walk with him. So it says that we're to press. That's a verb I really like. I raise boys and there is a ton of testosterone in my home. We're pressing all the time. <laughs> Phil and Katie probably know a little bit about this. I mean, it's, it's all the time. And the word press means to urge with force or weight, denoting the application of any power, physical or moral, to something that is to be moved or affected. Doesn't that sound like the Scott house? There's a, there's a lot of pressure, there's a lot of force that goes on at my house. And the story that came to me as I was studying this was the woman with the issue of blood. The Bible says that she went to many doctors and she didn't get better, but instead she got worse. But she knew that if she could get to Jesus, she'd be made whole. Again, her goal was Jesus. But there's a verse in there that paints a picture. It says that, and she went through the press. There was all these people crowded around Jesus. And she squeezed through and touched Jesus. And she was instantly made whole. And I think that for us, this is where this is where the rubber meets the road for us in our walk with God. Is it's really easy, all the stuff that we've just talked about, about the high calling of God in Christ Jesus and walking with Him, if we just shut the Bible and went home, it sounds like we can just live on autopilot for the rest of our life and everything's going to be okay. But then life happens. And then something bad in our life happens and it distracts us. It becomes an obstacle to us that we have to press through. And, you know, today is Palm Sunday. It's the day that we remember the time that's described in Matthew 21 where Jesus was going to Jerusalem and he was on a donkey and all the people began to throw down their coats and palm branches in front of him. And for the first time I put myself in Jesus' place. To my reading, there's at least two prophecies that were fulfilled in that very happening. In um, Zephaniah 9 and Isaiah 62, it was foretold that this was going to happen. Jesus knew that the cross was coming. If it were you or me, wouldn't you think it'd be really easy to allow? He knew where he was supposed to go. He knew where walking with God was going to take him. It's going to take him to the cross. Here are all these people, they're treating him like a king. They're treating him like as if he was who he really was, which is the Messiah. I think life gets in our way that way too sometimes. Where we know where God's calling us to walk. We know what we're called to do, but then life happens. And we get to this moment where everything feels like, what? oh wait, I don't have to go over there. I, I've already arrived, I'm here. And he just says, keep walking. If Jesus hadn't continued to the cross, the Bible says in Isaiah that his, he was set like a flint. His, he knew where God had called him to go, but the devil loves putting obstacles in our way. The Bible says in 1 Timothy 4, verse number 14, 
Do not neglect the gift that is in you, which has been given to you by prophecy with the laying on the hand of the eldership. Meditate on these things and give yourself entirely to them that your progress may be evident to all. Take heed to yourself and to your doctrine. Continue in them. For in doing this, you will save both yourself and those that hear you. I think people sometimes get in the way of our progress, our walk with God. You know, what I love, and I talk to my boys about this often, about how Paul encouraged Timothy to give himself entirely to this. How often do you or me, how often do we give ourselves 99% or 98%? And again, this isn't about evaluating yourself or whether you, if you're 85 or 72 or 93. No, but we know when we've left something on the table. We know when our life we're not really living all for him. We want to walk with him, but we also want to do this over here. But the Bible says that if we live that way, leaving it all on, on the table, giving ourselves entirely to them, that our progress will be evident to all. And one thing the Lord has reminded me of lately is to remember what progress looks like. The, uh, my ultimate goal in walking together with you all is not that eventually we're all exactly the same. Progress and peer pressure are two different things. We, we look on the outward, but God looks at the heart. And so we need to be really careful as we're pressing towards this calling, uh, this high calling of God in Christ Jesus, that if I find that me and Mike are not exactly the same, that means Mike has a lot more calling he needs to work towards. It's probably actually the other way, but, but we do that. The Bible says, and it warns us, it says to compare ourselves among ourselves is not wise. We can all be giving ourselves entirely to these things and end up being completely different. And the things that's going to bring us together is not how we all look alike or how, you know, I know that when we were starting the church, Paul wanted us to all go, you know, have church on, on horseback. You know, we're not all going to go be cowboys. And those things are really easy to see. Paul sees me on a horse, he'll know really quickly that I can't be part of a cowboy church. I like riding horses, but I can't ride them very long. But we need to understand that this progress that's going on, that's evident to all, is something that happens inside of us. That it, that it, it manifests itself, not in that we all look the same, not that we all wear the same brands or talk in exactly the same way or we all watch the same movies or go to the same places. No, I believe that that individuality that, God, that we've talked about is a strength for us. It's a strength for us as a church. So the goal isn't that we all end up being this exactly the same group of people. We're all little carbon copies of one another. That isn't the progress that's talking about, is talking about here. This progress comes out in how we treat our wife, and how we treat our children, and how we treat each other, and how in our, in our desire, how we treat rebuke, how we treat when somebody comes to us and says, brother, you need to work on that. We're like, oh man, you're right, I want more of Jesus. The progress is an inner thing. It's something, yes, it becomes evident, but it's not because we all, the progress is because we all become little cookie cutters of one another. We're becoming more and more and more like Jesus. All of us. That is what it means for us to give ourselves entirely. We'll all become more and more like Jesus. And sure, it's going to draw us closer to, together. But not because we're closer together, but because we're all closer to him. 
Um, I think another thing in this pressing is that we, overall, I feel like the Lord is encouraging me to be less introspective. To use, have less interest. I think sometimes we get focused. When we believe that we want to be more like Jesus, our first response is to look inside. And I do believe the Lord calls us to examine ourselves. And I think that's absolutely true. But the work is done by him. He does the work. And so, yes, if he brings something up, oh, that doesn't look like Jesus, okay. I find that I don't really have to go dig in deep to find something that's not like Jesus in me. He brings it up on a daily basis. Oh, I need to work on that. That's the Lord. Okay, as I'm walking with Jesus, that's going to get better because I'm going to be more like him. I think we need to look, le- we need to spend less time being all bent out of shape about who we aren't and concentrate on who he is. And as we do that, I think our, our focus goes from, you know, at the beginning of this message, I said we don't need to look back, but we also don't need to look in so much. Yeah, if the Lord calls you to a season of, of examining your heart, praise the Lord, obey him in that. But I think some of us live in that season. Some of us just sit there and just stew on all the things we're not and how we're failing and all the ways that we need to do better. I don't think that's the Lord either. I think we want, if, we're, if our gaze is towards him, again, that the Betty and Josh analogy, I'm, I'm more of an introvert than I was when I got married. Be, not because I'm trying to figure out how to be more of an introvert, because I'm walking with Betty. And, you know, Matthew 5, or no, Matthew 9, 35 says, then Jesus went about, all the cities and villages, teaching in their synagogues, preaching the gospel of the kingdom, healing every sickness and every disease among the people. But when he saw the multitude, he was moved with compassion for them because they were, they were weary and scattered like sheep with no shepherd. And then he said to his disciples, the harvest truly is plentiful, but the laborers are few. Therefore pray the Lord of the harvest to send forth laborers into his harvest. Michael Card, the, the songwriter, said, Behold, Behind every specific call, whether it is to teach or preach or write or encourage or comfort, there is a deeper call that gives shape to the first, the call to give ourselves away, the call to die. And one of the things that I've been encouraged lately is to remember that as I stop looking at me, there's a lot that the Lord is doing out there. In, in us and in outside of us, things that the Lord is doing that if I spend all this time worrying about me, I never ever see all the amazing things that God is at work doing. You know, we come from a background or from a church background that emphasized discipleship. And the way that got applied a lot of times is we need to work on ourselves. We need to help each other work on each other. But what happens is if we, if we believe discipleship, and I do believe in discipleship, we can't believe in discipleship to the exclusion of evangelism. We have to realize that it's not just about us being this little city set on the hill that are all spending the rest of the time until Jesus comes back working on each other so we become more like Jesus. No. We're to go out in the highways and byways and compel people to come in because we believe in a gospel of life and of joy and of grace and of peace that's worth talking about. And if we believe that, then it's going to ooze into every conversation, into the funniest places. God's just going to, it's going to bubble out. And we're going to tell people about the hope that we have. So, 
Final question. Where are you going? We already talked about this for a little bit, but the Christian life is a personal journey. It's something between you and the Lord. Yes, we're all here together. We're walking together. That's all good. We got that part. But this relationship with God is a walk between me and Jesus. And yeah, we're a family now. I have my family and we're walking together. But I don't want my children walking, me walking with Jesus and Betty walking with me and then Abel walking with Betty. And by the time it gets down to uh, Corey or the new baby, oh, no, we want to each, I want each one of my children to walk with the Lord. In the same way, we can't all walk with Jesus through Reese or through Phil or through Mike or through, you know, any one of us. We can't do that. We have to each walk with Jesus ourselves. I love how this is, it's, this is, this is um, illustrated. Jesus had 12 disciples. He had a group, then a group around that. And yet he went to Peter that night and said, Peter, do you love me? Not do you all love me, but do you love me? And I think that's the question the Lord is asking all of us is do we want to walk with him? Do we want to experience that eternal life of knowing him? Not, not us, but you and me. Because it's really easy to get in a big group of people and say, yep, yeah, we're all loving Jesus. I love when I can get Cliff to smile. That's always a good sign. Um, we're all loving Jesus. No, the Lord wants, uh, he wants to know, is Josh Scott loving Jesus? Do I want to know him more? Do, is, is it my greatest desire to walk with him every day? To know more of him every day? Is it my desire? Is it your desire? Ephesians 4, verse 14 says, that we should no longer be children tossed to and fro and carried about with every wind of doctrine by the trickery of men in, cunning, in, in the cunning craftiness of deceitful plotting, but speaking the truth in love may grow up in all things into him who is the head, Christ from, the whole, from whom the whole body joined and knit together but, what, but by what every joint supplies, according to the effective working of every part doing its share, causes the growth of the body for the edifying of itself in love. To me, that's the church. That is what we are trying to be. It's not about all of us doing the same thing. It's about each one of us walking with the Lord, doing what he's called us to do. And in doing that, we all grow up into him. That's the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. And then a verse I mentioned earlier, the Bible tells us in, a, in Matthew 5, that a city set on a hill cannot be hidden. And I believe that as we do this together, as each one of us seeks to walk with God and seeks to know him more and sees this high calling of God in Christ Jesus as not something bad and terrible or burdensome and hard, but sees it as a joyful thing of getting to walk with Jesus every day. Brothers and sisters, I believe God is going to light a fire inside of this church that people who are sick and sick of, with sin and dying and on their way to hell, I think God is going to draw those people here because his light's going to be shining. Not our light, his light is going to be shining. And we're going to know 
the, they're going to ask, what is the hope that you have in you? How in the world are you so happy? How in the world are you so joyful? It's because of Jesus. And we're, gonna, we're not going to point them to us. We're not going to point them to Phil. We're going to point them to Jesus. And I believe that as we do this together, each one of us saying, Lord, I want to walk with you, that that fitting together, that being joined together with the head, we're going to become a city on a hill that cannot be hidden. Let's pray. Dear Lord God, that's my greatest desire is to know you more, is to love you more, is to walk with you every day. And then after that, to see each one of us doing that together, becoming that city set on a hill where your light is shining and people that are lost and lonely, Lord God, they come and they meet you. I pray, Lord God, that you would make it so. In Jesus' name, amen.